Hallelujah. Thine the glory. Revive us again. Well, good day to you, brothers and sisters. Going to show you something cool as always. In this lesson, we're going to do a question and answer, a Q&A. Here's a question for you. This will be a short study. How do I want to word this question? Well, the first 4,000 years, let's say between Adam and the time of Jesus' first coming, that 4,000-year period, my question to you is this. Did Father choose people from the chosen seed line of Jacob, the house of Israel? Did Father, the final vine dresser, choose many individuals in this chosen seed line and send them His Holy Spirit and have His Holy Spirit dwell within the members, the chosen members of the house of Israel. I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit falling upon prophets, coming upon, falling upon, or falling upon the leaders of the house of Israel. That's not what I'm asking you. What I'm asking you is just the individual members that were faithful, the poor and the needy, faithful to Yah, that He decided they weren't of the seed line of Satan, and they were faithful, and they loved him. They were sinners. Did he send them his Holy Spirit and have his Holy Spirit dwell within them? Okay, that's my question to you. And the answer is actually pretty easy. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 63, verse 11 to get our answer to that question. I'm in Isaiah 63. I'm going to read a few verses for you, but the main answer is found in verse 11. Isaiah 63 is a pretty cool chapter if you're not familiar with it. It's an actual um, last days chapter, if you will, like the whole book of Isaiah. And it starts out talking about the battle of the great day of God Almighty at the end of the last seven years of the age, when Jesus uh, holds the my sword of Father, and now that it's in Jesus' hand and not the little horn man of sin possessed by Satan, when it's in Jesus' hand, it gets a new name. It's called his severe sword. It's also called his winnowing fan or his overflowing scourge. It's got a few different names. But that's, that's how Isaiah 63 starts out, talking about Jesus um, treading the wine press up the Jordan River Valley, and especially in southern Jordan, in the Edom area, Bosra. Not Bosra, Iraq, Bosra or Bosira, um, Jordan. In, in Edom, you know, just uh, east and southeast of uh, Judah. But that's how it starts out, talking about the second coming of Jesus and the battle of the great day of God Almighty and how he treads the winepress alone. It matches Revelation 19. So that's what's going on primarily in this chapter. But you come on down here. Look, we're going to start reading at verse 7, and we'll read down through 14. But the answer actually lies in verse 11 to our question. God's mercy remembered, using the New King James Version. I will mention the loving kindness of the Lord and the praises of the Lord according to all that the Lord has bestowed on us and the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their savior. In all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. He bore them and carried them all the days of old. So here we are talking about um, not you know necessarily the last 6,000 years, but really talking about the first 4,000 years. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them. And he bore them and carried them. We're talking about past tense here. All the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Okay, so put your thinking caps on now. 
So he turned himself against them as an enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea? Okay, we're talking about uh, during the time that Moses led them out of Egypt, right? Uh, he, where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them, who led them by the right hand of Moses, with his glorious arm dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name, who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they might not stumble, as a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of the Lord causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. So whether you realize it or not, you read the answer to the question in verse 11. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? Where is he who put his Holy Spirit within them? Who's the them? It's the house of Israel. Okay, so the Word of God actually says that Father, in the past, and during the time of Moses, and it wasn't just at that time, it was all the way up until the, the coming of, of Jesus, Father was putting His Holy Spirit and having His Holy Spirit dwell within them, not dwell within Moses or dwell within some other prophets or coming upon, falling upon. No, this is dwelling within them, his people, the house of Israel. All right, he bore them, he carried them, he put his spirit within them. So if anyone tries to tell you that uh, before Jesus walked the earth, the Holy Spirit was never sent to dwell within the family of God. That would not be correct. You might say, well, that's interesting, brother. I never really even heard people ask that question before, and I don't really think it's a big deal. Well, cool beans. <laughs> it, it, it's okay. Just little things like that I like to know the answer to. Why? Because Father takes the time to, to give us our answer. So that's pretty cool. A lot of clergy don't, don't think that's the case, but they fail to look in Isaiah 63. So that's the answer to that question. Yes, Father, the chosen ones from the chosen seed line of Jacob, Father put his Holy Spirit and had it dwell within them, those poor and the needy who were faithful, who loved him, didn't worship other gods. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Now, on the subject of the redeemed, you see it right here in verse 9. In all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. So, as Christians, we talk about how we're going to be redeemed, the day of redemption. Uh, we also talk about the day of salvation. But on the subject of redeeming the house of Israel during uh, the first 4,000 years, here we're talking specifically about the time uh, of, of Father using Moses and using the angels and leading Israel out of bondage. So he saved them from their bondage. He redeemed them from their bondage at that time. So, in other words, it wouldn't be correct to say the house of Israel has never been redeemed yet. That wouldn't be correct. Um, on that subject, I've got a few verses here in Exodus 6. Exodus 6, verse 6, is um, really gives us the answer to that question about, you know, has Israel, the house of Israel been ever been redeemed in the past? And the answer is yes. I'll go ahead and read the first uh, 13 verses for you in Exodus 6, verse 6. 
God renews his promise to Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh, for with a strong hand he will let them go, and with a strong hand he will drive them out of his land. And God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Lord, I was not known to them. I have also established my covenant with them to give them the land of Canaan, the land of their pilgrimage, in which they were strangers. And I have also heard the groaning of the children of Israel, whom the Egyptians keep in bondage. The house of Israel, the children of Israel. And I have remembered my covenant. Oh, I wish people at the UN would remember this covenant. And, try, and stop trying to act like it never took place or is still in effect. Verse 6, here we go. Here's our answer to the redemption question. Therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. Of course, on Egypt. I will take you as my people, and I will be your God. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who brings you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. So Moses spoke thus to the children of Israel, but they did not heed Moses because of the anguish of spirit and cruel bondage. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go in, tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the children of Israel go out of his land. And Moses spoke before the Lord, saying, The children of Israel have not heeded me. How then shall Pharaoh heed me? For I am an uncircumcised lips. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a command for the children of Israel and for Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So back in verse 6. Again, we were told, therefore say to the children of Israel, I am the Lord, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, I will rescue you from their bondage, and I will redeem you. Now, on the subject, getting back on the main subject, which is, did Father have his Holy Spirit dwell within individual chosen members from the chosen seed line, you might stumble, in that study, you might stumble upon Ezekiel 36. The reason I bring up Ezekiel 36 is because this passage, which, notice where this chapter is, it's before Ezekiel 37, chapter about the resurrection to life, did you know Ezekiel 37 is all about the resurrection to life? You know, those dry bones that get breathed on and come back to life at the end of the age? So this is the chapter right before that chapter. <clears throat> and Ezekiel 37 is right before Ezekiel 38 and 39 that talks about the sixth seal through the uh, return of Christ. All right, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, when Gog the Assyrian shall be used as a rod of anger to chastise uh, people in the land, especially Israel. You know, if Israel does not bow a knee to Jesus before the sixth seal is loosed. So, and then of course, Ezekiel 40 through 48 is all about the millennium. So here we are in Ezekiel 36. And we're talking about Father sending His Holy Spirit and having it dwell within the chosen ones. Watch this, brothers and sisters, during the millennium. So when you're reading in Ezekiel 36, especially when you come down to verse 27, and it's talking about the Holy Spirit dwelling within man, do not confuse the time period of man's history we saw in Isaiah 63, even though Isaiah 63 is primarily talking about uh, the return of Jesus Christ, God Almighty, to fight the battle of the great day of God Almighty. 
within Isaiah 63, we had that passage in verse 11 where it was reminding us of during the time of Moses leading Israel out of bondage of Egypt. You know, during that time, Father was sending the Holy Spirit to dwell within the house of Israel during those days. But here in Ezekiel 36, this is all about the millennium. So just get that straight. In other words, you can't use 36 to answer my question about the first 4,000 years leading up to the uh, Jesus' first coming. You can't use 36 as a witness to what I found in Isaiah 63 because Ezekiel 36 is all about the millennium. And, and we're going to read this. But in Ezekiel 36, it's talking about the bridesmaids whose lamps are not lit. In other words, the house of Israel, not the tares that get bundled and burned. And they're already marked because of the mark of the beast. All right, they get destroyed. But you have the bridesmaids whose lamps are not lit by the Holy Spirit, so they don't get glorified at Jesus' coming. But during the millennium, these bridesmaids from the house of Israel, who are unmarked, who are going who, and who are alive, they manage to either stay alive and be part of that 10% holy stump found by Jesus within Israel's borders, or they're the one third of Israel that got taken away as slaves to the beast cities that Jesus will make sure that they eventually over time will that remnant will be brought back to Israel. But any way you slice it, they weren't glorified, but they are unmarked, and they are alive. And during the millennium, Jesus is going to teach them. They're going to be taught, and they're going to, uh, of course, quickly come to the realization of who Jesus is. And Jesus, during the millennium, will send, or you could say Father, will send his Holy Spirit to dwell within the house of Israel that will be serving Jesus in Jerusalem and uh, and the rest of the land of Israel, which will get extended borders, by the way. Let's go ahead and read this. But again, you can't use, I can't use Ezekiel 36 to be a witness to Isaiah 63, the few verses that talked about the first 4,000 years. Pick it up in verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel. Again, we're talking about the second coming of Jesus and the battle and the millennium. But for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went, I, and I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God. And you see that a lot in Ezekiel 39, three chapters later. When I am hallowed in you before their eyes, for I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all the countries, and bring you into your own land. That's in reference to the one-third of Israel, says Zechariah 13, that is going to be taken away to the beast city as slaves during the time of Jacob's trouble. That's what this is referring to. Then I will... This is not talking about gathering you out of uh, Europe and bringing you to... or Russia and bringing you to Israel in the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s. That's not what that's talking about. That's talking about after the battle of the great day of God Almighty, when the land will long be desolate after the utter destruction, and after all the waste places, then slowly the kingdom of God will start forming, and the Middle East, especially around Israel, is going to become uh, the Garden of Eden again over time. Verse 24, For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of the countries, and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. 
This is during the millennium, verse 27, and cause you to walk in my statutes. My statutes? How can that be in the millennium? It's because you don't understand the millennium. You need to read Ezekiel 40 through 48. Okay. And you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. But a lot of followers of Jesus Christ read passages like this about the millennium and they get a little jealous. Well, I thought it was all about us. But yet now we're going back and look. it looks like it's all House of Israel focused. Well, remember, brothers and sisters, you get joined to Israel. Did you know that? You are grafted onto their tree and you become Israel. You become a member of the house of Israel. Even if I'm glorified? Yes! Hallelujah. Verse 28, Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and multiply it, and bring no famine upon you. This is the millennium. Verse 30, And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields, so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine amongst the nations, ever, ever, ever again. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Not for your sake do I do this, saith the Lord God. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. And you need to read the rest of that chapter. On the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities. Hallelujah. Well, brothers and sisters, let's end this lesson. I hope it's been a blessing to you. Now you know the correct answer to that question. And yes, Father sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within individual members of the house of Israel those four, first 4,000 years. Okay, It's not like Father waited until Pentecost to send his spirit to the house of Israel during, you know, uh, during the time of Christ. It, it, he did it before Christ. Do you agree or disagree? I don't see how you could disagree with Isaiah 63, 11. But I am curious what, what your thoughts are, brothers and sisters. Uh, I might do another lesson here. Uh, this evening, another Q&A on a, on a slightly different topic. Um, can't wait to see you next time. God bless.